reports. Um, Bishop called me when he was in Atlanta on his way back to Nigeria, and he said that God has miraculously provided the $8,000 that he needed for the automobile. <laughs> Praise God. Are we on yet? just want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you tonight. And also to give you a praise report. Um, and before I do that, I, I just want to mention this song. Hey, thank you, Aiden. <clears throat> uh, they played this song at Brother Diamond's church, and his band played it. They learned it that morning. It was amazing. They, they're such fantastic musicians, and they, they did a really great job. And as they were singing this song, you know, he, it says, uh, you've never failed me yet. And I was standing there, and God spoke to me, a rhema word. And he said, there's no yet in me. <laughs> I mean, that was powerful. He says, there's no yet in me. So you don't ever have to worry about God ever failing you because he won't fail you. Ever. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's no yet in me. Praise God. Amen. So it's good to be back. Um, went, went to uh, Brother David's, preached uh, on uh, Anoint the Shield. And uh, it was a great, had a great time. And, and their love and generosity um, helped raise $2,500 for my mission trip. So praise God. Amen. So we'll be able to um, do some feeding programs while we're there. And um, Pastor Sajeev, um, been praying for a car also. And um, I don't know if you've been reading about it on, on, on Facebook or in Messenger or anything, but he's been messaging me. He says, you know, please pray. We're praying for a car. We've been praying with him. And he was able to get a, a Marada, I think it's called, an Indian-made Marada SUV, brand new for uh, $9,000. And uh, the payments are $200 a month. And this, this sister from the America said she's going to take care of the payments for him every month. So praise God. Amen. God's on a move. God's doing some great things. Praise God. So I heard you had a great time Sunday. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, just to let you know, so nobody will accuse me of not letting them know. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll be here this Sunday, this week. And, and Wednesday next week, but that's next Sunday I will be in Connecticut. I will be uh, preaching uh, uh, an ordination service with Pastor uh, Layton. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he's ordaining his assistant pastor, and he wanted me to come and, and do that and share also, and they're going to take an offering for my mission trip also. So uh, we'll be there next week. Uh, are you off on Monday, Linda? Linda, 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 are you off on Monday? You off on that Monday? Okay. So we'll probably be back on that Monday. We will be back for prayer, though. I pr I'm pretty sure of that. Amen? <laughs> she wasn't paying attention. She was like, oh, what? <laughs> Amen. Well, let's get back into the Bible study. Unless you want to just praise and prayer tonight, it's up to you. But um, I'm looking forward to what God's doing. You know, I, I kind of peeked in uh, on somebody's video. Somebody videoed Monday night a little bit, and I got to peek in a little bit. So that was that was good. Did you have a good time Monday night? Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, you know, just keep pressing in and don't give up. You know, that's what the enemy wants us to give up and just go back to routine things, but we're not going to do that. Amen? Praise the Lord. Well, tonight's lesson is going to be on interpreting prophecy. Interpreting prophecy. The the proper hermeneutics of interpreting prophecy. Uh, how many of you read the prophecy in the Bible? And a lot of times we don't know how to uh, properly interpret that, so we have to go by certain guidelines in order to fully uh, get the benefit of those prophecies that God has given us. So the definition of the word prophecy is the supernatural ability to receive a message initiated by God and the grace to speak it forth. Now, let me say this. I want to clarify this from the very beginning. You can prophesy. Men and women can prophesy. But it doesn't make you a prophet. Amen? Just because a woman prophesies or a man prophesies doesn't mean that they're prophets. The prophetic anointing is a different office. It's a different gifting. Uh, so we have to be careful that we don't get those two mixed up. 
If you look with me, please, in Ezekiel 13, verses 1 to 3, you put up on the screen there. You can just mark it down if you don't want to turn to it. It says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel, who prophesy and say to those who prophesy out of their own heart, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. So God is telling the prophet Ezekiel, he's saying, I want you to prophesy. I want you to speak. When God gives a prophetic word, and he wants you to speak it out, or even sometimes you might be sitting in the, in the assembly, and you know, it might be uh, like during worship, and there's a break in the worship or whatever, and God gives you a word, just stand up and speak that word, because that word can change the whole course of a service. Okay, when I was when I was in uh, when I was in uh, Baton Rouge and and I was I was listening to that song and and God spoke that to me so clearly. He says, "There's no failure in me. There's no yet in me." I mean, that was powerful for me. I don't know about you, but that was powerful for me. And I was like, "Yes, Lord, there is no yet. You know, He hasn't failed me yet. You know, no, He has never failed me. He will never fail me." And, and I was like, thank you, Lord. And that just did something inside of me. Amen? He, is not, he says, there's no yet in me. Praise God. So here, Ezekiel, God speaks to him. He said, I want you to prophesy to the so-called prophets that are prophesying out of their own spirit, and they have seen nothing. And all you have to do is go on TV, and you'll see it. Now, some of those prophets are right. Some of those, are, the, the information they give is right. But can I tell you, a lot of it's familiar spirits. Amen. Devil knows your phone number. Devil knows where you live. In fact, when I was in, uh, when I was in Nigeria, uh, Bishop was telling me there was a church right down the street from him where the, you walk in there, you'll be a total stranger, and the pastor will tell you your phone number, tell you where you, your address and all that other stuff. And my, my question is always this, what's the purpose? What's the purpose that he knows your address and phone number? So what? Big deal. What does that prove? That doesn't prove anything. So again, here Ezekiel is told, you prophesy against these prophets, and you tell them, you know, that they're foolish and that what they're saying is not true. But that takes a lot of courage. Because I believe that the next revival that comes, that God's going to raise prophets. Now, I'm not talking about these uh, apostolic prophets in Kansas City. I'm not talking about those, those guys where there's uh, feathers coming down and gold dust coming down, all that. I could say a few <laughs> words, but I won't. I'm behind the pulpit, so I'll behave. But again, foolishness. People going to dead people's graves and, and laying on their graves to, to soak up their anointing. Like Amy Simple McPherson and, and you know, some of the old, uh, 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 Vicki Jameson, not Vicki Jameson, what's that other one there? Uh, the one that had the healing ministry there. Uh, I can't think of her name. Catherine Kuhlman and, and such, and people like that, you know, that have died and they go and they lay on their grave to absorb their anointing. That's necromancy. That's calling up the dead. Hello? And they use, they, they use when Elijah was buried, that they threw bones in and he came alive. So they use that as a proof text, which is a, which is a pretext, which is not any text at all. It's out of context. And so when you have the ability to speak, it's not going to be well accepted. Most of the times, these prophets came and they brought a lot of bad news. In fact, there's a couple of scriptures there, I think, where the prophecy went forth and the guy was prophesying. He said, don't prophesy anymore. Prophesy unto his good things. We don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear the bad things. We don't want to hear that, you know, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. We don't want to hear that. Prophesy to his good things. People like to hear good things. They don't like to hear bad things. But I believe in this next revival that God's going to break out across America is going to be true prophets. They're going to, they're going to stand up, they're going to speak, but they're going to be very heavily persecuted for what they speak. Not because they're speaking false doctrine, but because they're stinging the hearts 
of people's religious, um, you know, uh, affiliations and, and things that they're doing. So uh, prophecy is God speaking to his people through a person. God can speak through a person. How many times have you had God speak to you through a person? Okay. God can speak through a donkey. Okay. And it's not Mr. Ed. It's not Francis the talking mule. Okay. But God can speak to us just standing still in a worship service. He can speak to us something so clear and so real. But we have to be willing to accept what he says. God doesn't just speak for no reason. God doesn't just speak on Sunday mornings with, when Pastor uh, Mike was here or myself or others that are behind this holy desk and uh, uh, Pastor Tom. And we're here to speak the word of God. We're here to give you what God has. It's not so that we can just leave saying, oh, what a great sermon that was. What a great message that was. And then walk out and forget the message. That's not what it's about. God speaks through people. There are two major, uh, two uh, main types of prophecy. We're going to talk about that. Number one is what's called foretelling. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Foretelling is speaking forth a declarative message from God that does not provoke, uh, does not involve a prediction. So let's look at that for a moment. God who at sundry times, and this is also a proof text, okay? <clears throat> now, when I say prophet, let me just clarify because, <clears throat> excuse me, let me clarify because a lot of people get on the prophet bandwagon, okay? It's not a prophet like the Old Testament prophet. When the Old Testament prophet, they said, thus saith the Lord, God was using their mouth as a mouthpiece and was speaking to the people. The prophets today are prophets that are hearing, thus saith the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is speaking through them, but it's not them at all. It's the Holy Spirit is speaking to them. And a lot of the prophecies that are given today, uh, probably some of it is in part, some of it is not. So we only know in part, the Bible says. We only see things in part. We don't see the whole of something. So sometimes a person will get up and there'll be tongues and interpretation and, a, and then a word of God and a prophecy will come forward. And that prophecy, maybe two-thirds of the prophecy is good. A third of the prophecy may be the person. Okay? So again, uh, how do we know that the prophets are different? By the scripture. God who at sundry times, that means at different times and in different manners, he spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. We all agree to that, right? Amen? We can all say amen to that. Okay. Now, what about the New Testament time? What about now? Verse 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. See, they had the word of they, God used their lips to bring forth the word of God. In the New Testament, we had the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have the Holy Spirit, which they didn't all have back then. Only certain individuals were, had the Holy Spirit in them. There were only a few that God had allowed that to happen. But in the New Testament, everyone can be filled with the Holy Spirit. And everyone can hear his voice. Amen. So in the last day he spoke unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So that's a foretelling of something. You can see foretelling is mentioned also in Amos 3, 7, and 8. We're not going to go there, though, just to save some time. I don't know how, how long we're going to be able to get through this. I might have to continue next week. <clears throat> Why is it so important to study the prophets? Well, number one, the Old Testament prophets were God's vehicle through which to speak to his people. The Old Testament prophets prophesied concerning Christ in the church. You can go back, and even Jesus said, the Old Testament speaks of me. There's prophecies concerning with Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel of futuristic things. The New Testament writers made extensive use of the Old Testament prophets. You go back and read the New Testament, you'll see that they had said, 
Well, has Isaiah prophesied? Jesus even used the Old Testament. So people that say we don't need the Old Testament today don't know what they're talking about. Okay? Jesus used the Old Testament. And he's the founder of the New Testament. Okay? And he said many times, Well, hath Isaiah prophesied of you. You speak of me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Isaiah prophesied that. Isaiah spoke that. So many times you're going to see that in Scripture. The books of the prophets make up over one-fourth of, of your Bible. What are some of the names and titles of the prophets in the Old Testament? You'll see them uh, various uh, names ascribing to the prophets in the Old Testament, such as uh, man of God or seers or messengers of the Lord or servants of the Lord. Their name is prophets. Some, sometimes you'll, you'll come across someone who's a prophet and you don't even know their name. The name is obscured. You don't have a clue who it is. But nevertheless, God wants to speak to his people. And I always say this, the greatest way for God to speak to you, because sometimes you, you want to hear God speak, right? If God would only speak to me audibly. Believe me, you don't want God to speak to you audibly. Okay? If God spoke audibly to you, it, it causes a fear, a trembling when he speaks. Think about it, who he is. Even the Israelites didn't want God to speak when they were at the mountain. When he speaks, and he speaks clearly, right? I remember one time God spoke to Linda and told her, told her this. I don't know what she was going through or what she was thinking or whatever, but God spoke the scripture to her and said, no man putting his hand to the plow looking back is fit for the kingdom. Do you remember that? I remember God speaking to us a word, and that word came to pass. And you go, wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. You know, sometimes when we want God to speak to us audibly, we don't really know what we're saying. I remember one time uh, having a, an experience with God, and Linda was working in Cranston, and I was in North Providence, and, and I, I, God just showed up, if I can say it that way. For lack of a better word, he just showed up in that apartment. And the, and the power and the presence of God was so strong, I just had to take something and put it over my head and cover me. I was on the floor shaking like this, saying, God, what? I just sense your presence in this place. And then the phone rang. And I was like, ah, oh, stinking devil. He's trying to steal this time with you, Lord. And the Lord said, no, answer the phone. And I answered the phone, and it was Linda, and she was crying. And she was like, in Cranston, Rhode Island. And she said, ah, I just experiencing the presence of the Lord at her workplace. And she was weeping and crying, and I was weeping and crying. I'm telling you, God wants to show up. He wants to, uh, the ability of his people. But let me tell you something. God ain't going to waste his time or his thoughts or his words on the people that are going to continually disregard him. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst or they shall be filled. That's prophetic. If you want God to feed you, then you've got to be hungry. If you want God to quench your thirsting for him, then you've got to be thirsty. The woman had to go to the well. She didn't sit home and said, I'm thirsty, Lord. He said, get up and go. <laughs> go to the well. And she went to that well and who was there? There was a divine appointment by God of the prophet, Big P. And he was there, and she came, she came for natural, natural resources. She came to get water. But when she met him, and he said, give me the drink. And then he said, if you knew who was speaking to you, he would give you water that would... Never, never run dry. And she was like, give me of this water. And he said, go call your husband. She said, I have no husband. He says, and that you have spoken right. You've had five husbands. And the one you're with now is not your husband. 
How did he know that? He's a prophet. He wasn't telling her that information just to tell her the information so she could go, wow, you're something else, Jesus. No, it was to prove who he was. And she said, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. You're a prophet? You spoke those things? And then she changed the subject. You say we worship in this mountain. People, when they're confronted with a prophetic word and it brings out something in their life, don't want to be dealing with that. They change the subject. They want to go on to something else. But God doesn't want to do that. God wants to speak prophetically in this church. God wants to bring prophecy in this church. You know what? He wants to encourage us that, you know, <clears throat> um, you can look at some of the churches here in the area and they're boasting about one church, you know, over a thousand people and all that stuff. And I, I was saying to God, I said, you know, God, it just doesn't seem fair. Anybody ever complain to God? Right? It just doesn't seem fair, God. Here we are. We've been doing this for years. And we got a small group. And here this, this church comes in. In five years, they got over 1,000 people. You know what God spoke to me? Man judges according to appearance. He said, don't judge according to what you see. Because what you see is not always what's real. Okay, good enough for me. What is the background and development of this ministry of the prophet in the Old Testament? If you look back, you'll see that the concept of the prophetic ministry has its roots in the patriarchs. You see God speaking to man and telling him what to do. That's, prof that's prophetic. When God spoke to Abraham, think about that. Now, I want you to understand, Abraham was not a Christian. Okay? Abraham wasn't following Jewish rules. He was a pagan. He was an idolater. When God called Abraham, he wasn't serving God. And he told Abraham, he said, Abraham, get thee up from thy country and from thy father's house to a land that I will show you. That's prophetic. And I want you to understand, in order for you to get where God wants you to be so that he can speak further revelation to you, you've got to obey. If Abraham never got up and never went, didn't have triptych, didn't have a GPS. He didn't plug in the coordinates and then follow it. Can you imagine him going to his wife and saying, Hey, honey, God told me we, we got we to split this place. We got to go. Well, where are we going? I don't know. He just said, Get thee up from thy father's house and from thy land into a land that will show us. Now, most, most wives would say, that's crazy. You have no direction. There's no security in what you're saying. We can't do that. How are we going to live? What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? You have no idea, no clue. You know why? Because it takes trust. It takes obedience and trust to make it to that place that God has a fuller prophecy and revelation for you, for me, for this church. But we've got to be able to move. We've got to be able to go where God says to go. Come on, somebody. What's God, what, God, what is God saying to us? What we need to do is come to this altar. Unload the burden of our hearts and say, God, come in. I want you in my life. And when we do that, when we make the first step of obedience to that, then God comes and speaks even more. Are you getting this? Hallelujah. God used Isaac. He used Jacob. He spoke to Joseph. In fact, it was Moses and Samuel that laid the very foundation of the ministry in the Old Testament. God used them mightily. But how many times did the people come against them when they spoke things? When Moses was taking them out, and they were set free. They were the happiest people, man. When God showed up with all the, all, and, 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 you know, with the plagues and, and, the, and, the, and all the things against Egypt, man, and, you know, the water turned to blood and all this stuff, stuff man, they were like, yeah, okay, God, yeah, wow. God's on our side, amen. 
But then when they had to go through the desert, go through a tough time, what did they say? Word to God that we were better off in Egypt. You're out here taking us in the desert to kill us, Moses. And people are going, stone him, stone him. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, see, because prophecy and the prophetic is not easy. It's not an easy life. It's not an easy way. Because God wants you to get the better part over here, but it's going to take some getting to, huh, to get there. And as you're obedient, and as you're walking in that direction, God will be able to speak even more. But he won't speak more unless you take the first step over here. God's not going to bless you more unless you, you are faithful with what he gives you over here. Come on, somebody. Samuel developed this ministry to the place of prominence in Israel. He functioned on the high level of prophetic ministry. Look at 1 Samuel 3, verse 19 to 21. It says, So Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. Look at this, though. And let none of his words fall to the ground. Wow. Wow. I've been uh, talking and counseling with a sister up in uh, Vermont. Um, used to go to Pastor Diamond's church years ago, moved back up to Vermont, going through a real difficult time, real difficult situation in her life. And God's been... Uh, has to do with courts and custody battles with her ex-husband, and he's a nutcase and all this other stuff. And, and the judge has been ruling in his favor, and, he's, and she's just beside herself. And I told her, I said, watch what God's going to do. I said, just trust the Lord, and we're going to pray. And I prayed with her, and I prayed that God would turn the heart of the judge around, uh, do something. Well, she had a, a court case today that she had to go and file a contempt because of different things going on in, in that situation. And it was, the regular judge wasn't there. It was a substitute judge and gave her favor on three or four different things. And she texted me today. She said, Pastor, thank you for praying. She said, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. I said, I told you. God will vindicate you. God will, will be with you for truth. Stand for the truth. Don't, don't worry about anything else. God's going to come through. And he does. When God says something, it will happen. When man says something, that's a different story. But look at Samuel. Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. What a testimony to be able to say that God is with you. But the real question is, are you with God? Are you with God? Now, some people don't believe, and God still speaks apart from the Bible, but he does. I'm a firm believer that he does. He doesn't speak contrary to it. Like when God spoke to me and said, there's no yet in me. I believe that was God. Because there is no yet in God. He's always faithful. He can't be anything else but faithful. In fact, when he, Jesus comes back, on his thigh is written, faithful in truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's nothing more, uh, nothing less. He's faithful all the time. Even when we go through the battles and we go through wants or we go through difficulties, God's still faithful. Hallelujah. Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. God wants you to grow. God's going to tell you, this is the way, walk ye in it. But you've got to be obedient. You've got to want to walk in that way. <clears throat> Amen. You've got to walk in that way, because there's greater blessing. See, it says, and Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. 
The Lord will be with you through those growing pains. The Lord's going to be with you as you grow. The Lord's going to be with you when you go through those difficult times because when you grow, it's going to hurt. How many kids when they have grow, they're growing, they get growing pains. They get pains in their knees and in their legs and all that stuff, and they're like, oh, man, I feel terrible. But they're growing. In the same way, and spiritually, there's going to be spiritual growing pains that take place because God is going to say, I want this. Give me this. And he starts taking things away from you, and you go, wow, <laughs> I'm losing everything. God says, no, you're gaining everything. That's the only place I know with God is that when he takes something away, he's all, it's always for a reason and a purpose that's far greater than what you're giving up. <clears throat> and it says, when God was with him, he let none of his words fall to the ground. Whatever Samuel said was going to happen, happened. That's amazing. That's amazing. Praise God. That's amazing. Next verse. <clears throat> and all Israel from Dan even to Bathsheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. One of the tests of a true prophet in the Old Testament was if he spoke something, it came to pass. Now, there are some prophets that prophesied things that didn't come to pass because it was futuristic. Remember I told you there's two different kinds of prophets. Prophecy. We'll talk about that. What's that? Verse 20? Let's go to verse 21. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Let me ask you, what, what are you holding in your lap? What are you holding on the side of you? You know... I understand when they come out with the book. Many years ago, it was a Bible, but they called it the book. I, th I think that kind of took away a lot of the reverence for God's Word. It's not just a book. That's why I don't like to see the Bible on the floor. I'm not being religious. I'm not being a legalist. But this is God's Word. We won't let our best shirt touch the floor. This is God's word. And if I'm someplace, even if I'm a guest speaker, and I'm sitting in the front row, and if somebody has their Bible on the floor, I go pick it up and give it to them and say, please don't put that on the floor. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So that's God's word. We need to respect God's word. Have a holy reverence and respect for the Word of God. Now, that doesn't mean you can't write in it because you're not adding to the Scripture. You're adding your little notes and stuff like that. And what God speaks to you, wow, you underline it. You know, that's fine. You can't change it. The prophetic office also remained strong all the way through Malachi. Malachi was a prophet. The period of the Old Testament ends with no strong prophetic voice and is referred to as the 400 silent years. God gave warning after warning after warning after warning after warning, and you know what? God decided to be silent. Think about that. 400 years of God not speaking a word to any. Not a word of encouragement, not an uplifting word, not a word of correction, not a word of instruction, none of that. Not until the time of John the Baptist there was a voice crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. In other words, here he comes. <laughs> it was 400 silent years of no word. Now the word was going to become. Yeah. 
He's saying, these people don't get it. So I'm going to send my son. I'm going to send the word that was with God and the word was God. I'm going to send the word down. He's going to become flesh and dwell among them. Wow. What are the differences in expression among the various prophets in the Old Testament? What are some of the expressions? Number one, they were prophets of guidance. The prophets would tell them, Thus saith the Lord, the Lord says, go down to the valley or go down here or go there and do this or go there and wait here. And they'd obey, hopefully. They were prophets of visions. Some of the prophets in the Old Testament could cl classify as prophets of vision, like Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, especially Daniel, where he prophesied things in the last days. And he spoke these things that were going to happen during the time of Antichrist. During, and that was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later. Isaiah prophesied in a vision. He had to have a vision. He said, in the year that King Cyrus died, I saw the Lord. That's a vision. And he was high and lifted up, and his train filled, his glory filled the temple. There were prophets of testimony. A lot of times these, these prophets' lives were used as a testimony to speak. Was it Hosea that God told to marry a prostitute? Was it Hosea? There was another one that was told to cut up an animal and throw all the pieces all over the place as an example. There was another, there was another prophet that was laying on his left side for three years. I think it was three years. As an example. They were prophets of Scripture. The prophets of Scripture are the ones with which we are most familiar with because of their writings that have come down to us. These prophets did no miracles. They simply spoke the word of God. These prophets included two categories, the major prophets and minor prophets. And those classifications aren't because one is greater than the other. It just means that their letters were larger, that's all. The major prophets or former prophets, as they are sometimes called, include Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. The minor prophets, uh, or the latter prophets, are they uh, sometimes called that way, include all of the rest of the pro prophetic books from Hosea to Malachi. So what are some of the important guidelines in understanding prophecy? It is important to understand the historical context of the prophecy. And we can do this by asking some of these questions. Here's some of the questions you need to ask. When was the prophecy given? Who was the prophet? What is the historical context into which it was spoken? For whom was the prophecy intended? What meaning did it have for those who first heard it? What was God's purpose in giving the prophecy? And what is the result that God was trying to produce with this prophecy? The answer to these questions will help you understand how to apply the prophecy appropriately. Secondly, it is important to discern if the people's, if the prophecy is declarative or predictive in nature. If it's declaring something, you know, like, for unto us a child is born, to us, unto us a child, uh, you know, a son is given, and, is, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and it's, it's, it's being more de declarative than predictive, but can also include a little prediction in there. It's important to discern if the prophecy is conditional or unconditional in nature. Many of the prophetic utterances that were given were of a conditional nature. In this case, God spoke to his people in the form of warning or promise of blessing. God would bring some kind of judgment if there was no obedience to what he was speaking. God told his people through men like Jeremiah that if they did not repent, God would remove them 
from the land. If you look in Jeremiah 18, verse 7 and 10, I'm just going to read it for you. The instant I speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, this is also for the United States, to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. So sometimes it's like a promise. Can you ever not fulfill a promise? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, Johnny, if you're good, okay, you're getting ice cream. Okay. Then all of a sudden, Johnny's not good anymore. Okay, well, you withhold the ice cream. Well, you can't do that. You, you're breaking the promise. No, you can break the promise. Hello? Because they didn't fulfill their part of the promise. But some people think, well, if I do that, my kid's going to think I'm, uh, I'm not a man of my word. No, 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 or a woman of my word. No, 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 no. You have every right to break the promise. God did it. He says, if you don't obey me and repent and do what I'm telling you, I'm going to relent of what I said I was going to do. Hello? Many of the prophetic words of the Bible have more than one application. If you read Daniel, you'll see that he talks about the abomination of desolation, standing in the holy place. Well, that happened with Antiochus Epiphanes. He went in and he desecrated the temple with a pig, slaughtering a pig on the altar. That happened, literally. But then Jesus, after, states that it's going to happen in the future with the Antichrist. So it can have a fulfillment, pr prophetic fulfillment at that time, but it can also be futuristic at the same time. Amen? You have a, the historical application, you have the prophetic application, and you have the ultimate apl uh, application. And does this prophecy have an ultimate meaning and application for those living in the last days prior to the second coming? The answer is yes. If you read Ezekiel, Daniel, if you read um, Revelation, people want to know what's going to happen in the world, read Revelation. We studied the book of Revelation. We went through it verse by verse. Those things are going to happen. Get it into your mind and in your head. Those things are going to happen. There is an appointed time when those demons that are in chains are going to be loosed. There is a, an appointed time when Jesus is going to stand and he's going to unroll the scrolls of God's wrath to be poured out upon the earth. That's going to happen. But in the meantime, God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ, which I believe is the rapture. I believe he's going to take us out before his wrath is poured out. So that's, an, that's a... Prophecy that has an ultimate application to it. But I, I want to just, since it's already quarter past eight almost. There is New Testament prophecy. There was a prophet that spoke to Paul. And he used object lessons. And he took an old rag. He took a rag and he, he bound Paul's hands. Remember that? What was his name? Thank you, Pastor. Agabus. And he bound Paul's hand. He says, so shall you go down to Jerusalem. And he prophesied over Paul. And he spoke to him of his, the death he was going to die. Jesus spoke prophetically to Peter told him that he was going to die for his faith. God will speak to us today to know what to do, what not to do, where to go, where not to go. 
I believe when I was a little, little boy, even before I knew Joe, when I was real small, I lived um, right on Holly Street, right behind the laundromat that's there. And there's a gas station on the corner. That red, I think it's Red House or a Brown Tan House. I, I live there. And a bunch of kids were going to play at U.S. Furniture, which is up uh, the street of, on County where that white church is. And there's a factory building. But in, in between, you could go in the back, and there was a, like a, a pond there, a, a gully there filled with water. And I remember they're going there and playing with my friends. And my friends made a little boat, and they said, let's go in the boat. And I went to go in the boat, and, and something literally stopped me and said, do not go. I heard those words, do not go. I didn't know who it was. I had no idea. And when I heard those words, do not go, I stopped, and I told my friend, no, I, I, I can't go. And he, they made fun of me. Oh, what's the matter, your baby chicken? Blah, I'm, 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 I'm chicken. And I was like, no, I'm not going. And he went on there with, his, with four or five of them, went on that, that little raft they made, and it sunk. And his brother drowned. And he tried diving in, diving in to get him. He wouldn't. He came running out. I ran with him to a house. I remember knocking on the door, telling him they called the fire department, and they, they dragged the pond, and they, they found him. He was dead. That could have been me. Don't go. To obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. Interpreting the prophecy in accordance to the will of God to make sure that it lines up with Scripture. So if somebody comes and prophesies, I remember one time Linda and I, we were part of a church. Remember that guy came and he spoke something, and it was like cold water went all over the... I, I think he spoke against the rapture or something. I, I don't quite remember what it was. But it was, like, it was like somebody took a bucket of cold water over the entire congregation, and, and he was like, what's wrong? There's something wrong. And the pastor had to come and straighten him out. <laughs> okay? But that's because we were well taught God's word. You have to test the prophet to Africa, and they, they begin to cry. Well, I'm here, but I have no connection, nothing. And God said, I never told you. Just because somebody says something doesn't mean it's God. Now, there have been times when people from this church came and told me things, and I said, that's not God. That's not God. They didn't listen. Now they pay the consequence. Some of those consequences are grave. I'm serious. Sometimes God uses me in the prophetic. When we had assistant, when I had assistants here before Pastor Tom. God began to reveal some things. They tried to split this church. They went off and started another church. I told you all, it wasn't of God. It won't last. Where is it? Hello? There's one thing I do know. I know when God speaks. And I know when it's right. And I know when it's wrong. We're still here. Through thick and thin and ups and downs and mistakes and everything we made. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. But you know what? We're still here. We're still serving. We're still striving. Come on. Because God called us to this place. When God calls you, he equips you. And the only time I'll ever leave this place is when God's grace lifts off me. That's how you know. When God's grace lifts off you, that's when you know. There's nothing more that can be done. And I'm not going anywhere until that 
if that ever happens. God says, stay here for the rest of your life. I'm here. But if you want the best for God to move in your life, then be obedient to the steps of holiness and righteousness. Make the right steps in the right direction. Don't go back. Don't, go, don't desire the things of the world or the people in the world. People in the world will, will take you down. Oh, I've got to be a witness. Yeah, be a witness, but don't blow your witness. You know, one of the mistakes I think a lot of churches today are making is that they're trying to be like the world to attract the world. That's not what attracts. What attracts is opposites. When you are willing to follow that prophetic word, go down to the potter's wheel. Think about that. It was Jeremiah, right? Wasn't it Jeremiah? God tell God tell God speaking to Jeremiah. Okay. Now for just for a moment, not being sacrilegious or anything, this way I'm God, okay? And I'm speaking to Joseph. And I said, Joseph, I'm speaking to you, right? Go down to the potter's house and I'll speak to you there. Yeah, but you know what logic says? Well, God, why can't you speak to me right now? You're speaking to me now. Right? Most of us would say that. It's a little inconvenient for me to go down to the potter's house. You know how many miles, of, you know how many gas I've got to put in my car to go down to the potter's house? You know, you know my time I've got to go down? Why can't you, God, just speak to me as you're speaking to me now? And God says, I didn't know you were the boss. I'm telling you to go down there, and I'm going to speak to you there. But you have to get up out of your seat, and you have to go down to where the potter's house is. Don't expect God to speak to you if you're going to sit in your seat and say, well, God, just speak to me. He ain't going to do it. Because that's what prophecy is about. God says, do this, you do it, you're blessed. Do this, you grow. Do this, you'll grow. They that are planted by the rivers of water shall flourish. If you're planted and rooted and grounded in the things of God. Not these fly-by-nights going to this church, run into that church, run into this church, run into another. They have no roots. They're all over the place. God says, no, you stay firm, founded, rooted, grounded. So you know why? Because when all of the stuff starts to fly, and it's going to fly soon, okay, I'm telling you, it's getting wicked out there. I mean wicked. Churches are getting wicked. There's witchcraft in churches. It's getting very, very bad. And a lot of people that don't have discernment, guess what's going to happen to them? They're going to be sucked in. Because the devil knows his time is short. And I was, we were talking about this down in Baton Rouge. Because Diane was saying, oh, my God. You know how they are down south. Oh, my God, how come the things are getting so bad? I said, because of the spirit of lawlessness. If we believe Jesus is coming back, there's the pro prophetic, right? The prophecy is Jesus is coming back again. That's the prophecy. What is the hindering of that prophecy? The Antichrist is going to come. He's going to make havoc. He's going to deceive people. He's going to try to get people away from God. He's going to try to pull people away from God. He's going to lie to them. He's going to deceive them. They're going to be, they're going to be uh, 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 ridiculed and, 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 and oh, you, you know, you've got to come this way. This is the way. Come this way. And no, when you're solidly founded, I'm not going to go that way. I'm going to stay here. It might cost you to be here alone. What if your whole family gets deceived and tells you, I'm not following Jesus anymore? What are you going to do? What if your husband or your wife decides that you don't want to follow God no more? What are you going to do? Give up on God? We've got to stand. Wherever there's a prophetic utterance, the enemy's going to come in and try to destroy. He's going to try to take you away from the things of God. And that's why sometimes I get a, I get a little bit protective because I'm a pastor. Okay, if, if I don't see you in church, I'm going to call you. Hey, man, where you been? What's going on? 
Don't let the devil rob you. I, wrote, I said that the other day on uh, Facebook. I said, don't let the devil rob you. Go to church this morning. You know, I got a comment from somebody. I said, thank you, Pastor. I needed that. And ended up going to church. They were going to stay home. I don't know. Okay? It's the truth. We can get so lazy. It's not about that. It's like get up out of that bed. <laughs> get up out of that situation. Okay, Linda didn't sleep a wink last night. Went to work all day, and she's here. Sometimes you don't sleep two hours a night. She's here. And I say, well, if she can do it, we can do it. Come on. Why not? You know why? Let me tell you why she's here. Because she wants to be. Sometimes I'll tell her, why don't you stay home? No, no, I'm going. And as she goes, God blesses her. Blesses her with strength. Yes. What's that? That's right. When we dedicated our life, when we said, Lord, come into my life, be Lord and master of my life. The Bible says your life is not your own. You've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, glorify God in your body. If you're truly a Christian, a biblical Christian, your life is not your own. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to him. Amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. Who wants to close in prayer tonight? Come on. I need somebody to close in prayer. Who's going to close in prayer tonight? Tara, get up here. Get up here. You want to obey the you want to obey the word of God? It says be ready in season and out of season. So get up here. You're limping. Are you all right? Your leg is still soft? Okay, well, let's pray. Her leg swells up. You have not because you're asking not. Put your hand on your leg. 